Thank you. As you heard, my name is John, and this is Sondra, and together we make graphic novels and comics under the name Metafrog. Recently, we made two graphic novels for the Big Cat series, Harris and Grace, and Freya. Now, as well as making graphic novels, we've also had the pleasure of doing more than 700 workshops, talks, and these are ways of inspiring literacy skills through graphic novels. So we're delighted to have been asked by Collins to do this webinar, and what we'd like to do with you today is share some of our experience of what's worked well. First of all, we'd like to briefly introduce ourselves. Now, I grew up in the west coast of Scotland, and even though my parents didn't have very much money, they were happy to have a quiet child, and they weren't snobbish about what I read. So as well as reading books, I found myself reading comics, and I realised how much I loved the comics. I was also lucky enough to have a little green library card, and that opened up a whole universe for me. When we do our talks in schools, we like to emphasise the importance of reading and how libraries can indeed unlock a child's imagination. One of the best things that I found in the library was Hershey's Adventures of Tintin. And when Sandra and I met in 1994, we realised that even though we'd grown up in different countries in different decades, we'd actually grown up reading a lot of the same things. So I am French. I was born in France and grew up there and then moved to Scotland um, later on. But as a child, I read my way through um, all the Tintin, uh, Tintin books uh, because it was already in, in my family. In fact, in France, comics are called the ninth art. So most people will read comics there. Um, so that's what I grew up reading. And then um, as a teenager, I read my way through um, the classics of French comics, all sorts of different genres uh, that were available, like adventure comics, um, science fiction, crime or literary comics even. And uh, when I was about 20, I moved to Scotland. I'd always uh, been drawing and painting and taking photographs. And I'd kind of thought about making comics. Um, but arriving in Scotland, I met John and we clicked together. I'd always dreamt of being a writer, and in a way, meeting Sandra was a catalyst. Not only did we get on well and click together, as Sandra said, but we also more unusually decided that we wanted to work together. We first of all started by making our own comics, and we self-published them, and then we self-published books. In the Louis Red Letter Day, we were lucky that people read it, even luckier that people reviewed it, and it was also nominated for several prestigious industry awards, as Bethan said. So what was originally intended to be a one-off book turned into a series because we realised that we'd fallen in love with the Louis character. And here's a pile of pages from one of the Louis books. So they were made by hand on watercolour paper. Uh, as you can see, quite a lot of pages to make up a whole book, so it takes a long time. Louis books explored themes like the environment and how important that was. The Uh, so we did three books, The Red Shoes and Other Tales, The Little Mermaid, which was a fairy tale that I'd loved since I was like about four years old. Um, and then lastly, we uh, created Bluebeard. As well as making the books, we also travelled regularly around the world to festivals, going to France, to Angoulême, and going to America often several times a year. And what we saw at these festivals was an increasing interest, an interest in comics and graphic novels, but also more and more people making comics and graphic novels. When we started making comics uh, some 30 years ago now, um, there was very few people making comics um, and reading comics, even uh, especially in the UK and the US. Um, and over the past probably five to 10 years, there's been a huge proliferation of graphic novels, especially for kids. And so now there's lots of different titles, uh, great titles available uh, for everyone to choose from. And um, Collins have their own line of graphic novels um, as well. There's different books for different um, reading ages and uh, different reading levels. And we've made two uh, graphic novels for Collins. Uh, one is a twisted tale um, called Harris and Grace, and the other one is called Freya. The other participants at our workshops love to try and guess what original fairy tale Harris and Grace has been based on. It's a take on Hansel and Gretel, of course, and it's set in contemporary Scotland. This was a great location for a story, because Scotland's very beautiful, very picturesque. That also allowed us to speak in our own voice, because I grew up here, and Sandra and I have been living here 
for more than 30 years. So um, the books are um, basically the chapters. We um, start and end them with a little bit more text so that uh, children can get used to reading uh, longer bits of text. And that's interspersed with um, speech bubbles so that there's a bit of light relief as well. As well as being set in modern Scotland, which encourages people to think about equality and diversity, the story itself is quite different from the original fairy tale. There's a new character introduced, an uncle Claude. He's accompanying the children in their adventure. The actual fact he turns out to be not very helpful, and the children are forced to rely on their own resources. At the end, as well as making a twist on the original tale, we're allowed to look at the difference between the supernatural and the scientific, and even introduce a strong female character that raises discussion about what possible roles women could have to work in science, like being an environmental scientist or conservationist. Priya literally poured out of me. Sandra said, I don't know what's happened to you. Perhaps it's because I grew up in Scotland and I am Scottish, but it's a story about a famous female Scottish clan chief. And because we couldn't really find famous female Scottish clan chiefs when we did our research, we made a fictional one, which sort of redressed the balance. But it's a very exciting adventure story. And when Freya's father dies and she's in line to become clan chief, her cousin Ronald has other ideas. He's quite a nasty piece of work, and he's got his eye on the clan chief position for himself. So it's only because of Freya's strength, courage and resourcefulness and her friendship with her cousin Anne, she manages to survive. It's a very exciting adventure story. We managed to fold in a lot of myths and legends and stories that are told in Scotland through song, for example, a Loch Ness Monster. And you can even see the suggestion of Bonnie Prince Charles escaping to France. It was a great book to research. And when we're working with people in workshops, we talk about the importance of research and libraries and immersion. Looking for strong female Scottish historical figures, of course, was Mary Queen of Scots. And spoiler alert, she didn't have a very happy ending. But even people like Flora MacDonald, their story is often overshadowed by the man in their story because it's history. It's been written by men for men. So the reference in Flora MacDonald's story is usually to Prince Charles. Over the years, as we said, we've done more than 700 workshops in primary schools, secondary schools, at universities, colleges and art schools, talks and workshops. And as we promised, we'd like to share some of the things that we found have worked out well in these places. We often work with the librarians in schools, as well as just teachers. And we also do things which allow a bit more in-depth interaction. For example, we were writers in residence at the Edinburgh International Book Festival, where we did outreach work in local schools, Shawlands Academy with EAL, that's English as an additional language students. We were also invited by The Guardian to talk at their Reading, Pleasure, Reading for Pleasure primary teachers conference as interesting graphic novels began to grow and grow. And we were even keynote speakers at the School Library Association conference. Whenever we're doing talks about comics, the most important thing for us is making young people feel that they can be creative, making them feel empowered. So what we always emphasize is that you don't need to be able to draw to make your own comic. Showing mini comics, we're able to explain that with words and pictures, the only limit is really your own imagination. And a great exercise um, to do with children is to uh, get them to come up uh, with uh, their own character. And we emphasize the importance of creating a strong character. Um, like, for example, SpongeBob is a great example. It's instantly recognizable. Making a strong character and thinking about maybe having a family of characters or a world for your character or a story for your character. These are activities which can be springboards for further activities. Um, as John said, um, children don't necessarily need to be able to draw to make uh, their own comic, but um, they also quite like to practice um, their uh, drawing skills um, and having tip sheets um, is quite a useful thing. So they can learn how to draw um, a face in proportion, for example, and they can learn how to draw the body or how to draw in different angles as well. That's a very important thing um, in making a comic because obviously there's lots of uh, different types of drawings from different angles to create. And it helps them to tell or learn to tell a story in a dynamic way. And of course, they may not be able to use the tip sheets in the session, but it's great for continuity and they can be provided as follow-ups after the session. Drawing facial expressions opens up the opportunity to have discussions of sympathy and empathy and human emotions and how they work in stories. 
And um, it's also uh, good fun to um, get children to learn how to draw in perspective. Uh, some of them like to take on the challenge. Uh, so here you can basically explore um, basically how the world looks in real life versus how it looks in uh, two dimensions. It's also what we call stealth education. It's a way of introducing ideas like engineering drawing, turning the two dimensional into three dimensional. Some of the young students really like to take on this challenge, as Sandra said. Here you can see one using a reference city and drawing it in their comic. They can even bring everyday objects into their stories and draw them with a sense of perspective. Drawing is great fun and it kind of frees up the brain. But we also want to encourage reading, writing and literacy in general. So we have a trick that we call five words. So once the children have worked to make their own monster or their own character, we encourage them to think about special powers that a character might have, special diet requirements the character might have, and anything that they can bring to the character to make it a stronger character. So for example, our Louis character with his friend FC, which is short for formulated companion, is cute, innocent, hardworking, and even though he's friendly, he's sadly quite lonely as we were exploring ideas of how fragmented our society. The children don't need to use all five words, but using words it encourages them. We say to them, you don't need to be able to spell the words, and you can put them down in any language you like. They can then think about the opposites, because that could provide a springboard for creating a sidekick, or indeed for a villain. And it can unlock the doors to making the world of the story, thinking about different story types and how important stories are to us. So five words can um, help them to basically describe the personality of their uh, characters. And then from there, they can uh, can spark ideas into um, ideas for stories themselves. Uh, what we like to do sometimes is to um, give pupils an exercise, which is picture story ideas. So they come up with a character, a story title, and also a st so story summary. So from their story idea, they basically have to write down um, in a very short paragraph what their story is about. As an example, we, we use Fire, which has been a thrilling story for us to write. It's quite a simple story. We talk about basic story types, how they tell us about ourselves, tell us about others, and often carry important information. We also talk about story structure and give an introduction to visual storytelling, comparative literature, and structural ideas and aesthetics. We can even use newspaper cartoons or newspaper comic strips. Peanuts is wonderful. The adventures of Charlie Brown and Snoopy and their friends. Any good story has a beginning and a middle of it. And we encourage the participants of our workshops to sketch out their stories and to recognize that when you're drawing a story, the universe largely comes alive in the reader's mind. Language of comics is also a great way to get the children excited about making their story. We show them things like closure, we don't have to show the whole monster, but we can just let the reader's imagination fill in the blanks. Simple things like onomatopoeia, it's a great introduction to literature and literary ideas. And we teach them how to be economical with their speech bubbles and narrative boxes and start to understand panels and framing comic action. So um, traditionally, a comic would start um, uh, by uh, much as in a movie, in fact, uh, with establishing uh, the scene and then introducing the characters. So you get the where and the who. Um, and here in uh, the first page from Harris and Grace, uh, we also introduce the scene with uh, a long paragraph and uh, describing basically the atmosphere and what's going on in the, the characters' lives. Um, you get different types of framings that you can um, use in uh, comics or you can recognize in comics. For example, um, there's mid shots, close ups, zoom outs, or uh, general uh, views, uh, much like in the movies, in fact. Um, so these can be used to different effects. For example, if a character says something important uh, or has special emotion, you can use a close up. You can um, have different camera angles, same as in the movies again. Um, so for example, you can have a worm's eye view, uh, which is the camera placed, uh, for example, on the floor and looking up uh, towards the character. And that uh, gives a sense that the character may be threatening. Or you can have a bird's eye view, which is when the camera is on the ceiling and looking down on the character. And that gives you a sense that the character this time is feeling threatened. Both of these devices add a dynamic aspect to the visual storytelling. With a great for, for introducing ideas and keeping the storytelling interest. You can also have uh, different types of 
point of view, uh, much like in uh, traditional prose. Um, so, for example, here in Freya, we've got um, the scene depicted uh, from the point of view of the main character. We see the prison bars. We also see that Freya's hands are trembling. So it encourages empathy and sympathy and thoughts about what it's like to be someone else. One of our favourite things to do in workshops is actually quite a dangerous thing. We ask the participants to switch their brains off and then tell us how their brain knows who the main character is on a comic speech. This is a page from the Alec Ryder graphic novels, but the main character is actually in all the panels. The main character is rendered in a slightly darker colour. The speech bubbles are encouraging our brain to look at the main character. The main character has a panel on their own to get involved in the action. There's lots of ways that looking at a simple comic page can encourage young people to develop their critical thinking and to think about how things work visually and how the language of signs develops for different cultures and different readers. This is a page from uh, Coraline, the Coraline graphic novel. And basically comics are, um, they can be brilliant at expressing themes um, within stories. Um, so for example, here, um, Coraline has moved into a new house with her parents um, and it's a bit haunted and uh, she, the, her parents have gone away uh, from the house and she doesn't know where they are or if uh, they're even going to come back. And the artist has used quite a few visual tricks um, to show us how Coraline is feeling at this point without having to use any words or put it in any um, narrative boxes. So, for example, uh, she's uh, standing against a dark doorway. It's completely black behind her. And that's deliberate. It shows the great unknown. Or at the bottom of the page, Coraline is sitting at the kitchen table. And you notice that it's completely white behind her. The artist should normally have um, drawn the background and the details. But he's deliberately left it blank to show um, that Coraline is feeling lonely. So although the thought bubble tells us that Coraline's hungry, the single glass of water, the single slice of toast, the sense of neglect, the kind of sad pizza slice, all tell us that she's not only hungry, but she's also lonely and maybe even a little bit alienated. So this is a great way to begin a discussion about how important it is to think about how you live, how your family lives, how your culture lives, all of that from a single comic page. Comics are very different from films. You can draw comparisons, and there are comparative literatures, of course, but comics are basically broken down into a double page spread. That's the single basic unit of the comic. And you can sew ideas into the very passing of time in comic. So this is a page from uh, Louis Red Letter, one of our graphic novels. And um, here we've shown time passing at the top of the page by repeating the same um, image three times. Uh, but we've just changed uh, the light level slightly to show that time is passing. On this page from Louis Neitzel at this time, we've used a glass of water um, to show time passing and the water level diminishes as the night progresses. And we can see that something's not quite right with Louis because of the little cartoon squiggles. You don't need a big budget in comics to make special effects. All you have to do is change the shape of the thought of it and a careful reader will know it's a different level to the story, a dream or perhaps a nightmare. And um, these pages from Harris and Grace are good examples um, to show how to, you can use framing to bring out um, emotions, for example, or atmosphere. So on the blue page, we've got Harris, who is um, he's the only one awake uh, at night in the forest, and he's getting really scared. And um, so we're using uh, close-ups to basically uh, bring out his feelings. And then we're even changing the point of view with placing the camera behind him, looking out on what he's seeing. And on the other page, um, we've got Uncle Claude, who's having a little bit of a meltdown. Um, and so we are tilting the panels at angles to uh, emphasize this feeling. So you can use the actual nuts and bolts of the comic itself to help tell the story. It can become part of the visual storytelling. Color is an enormously important element. So um, you can basically use color to bring out themes and atmosphere or even codes and different scenes, or, uh, as well as just lightening up the comic itself. So for example, on these pages, uh, we've used blues, greens, and purples. Um, to bring out the atmosphere of the creepiness as well as the night scene. As well as working in schools and libraries, we've also had the pleasure of using comics in different contexts. For example, we were invited to do workshops at one of our favourite places in Glasgow, Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum. And after doing an introductory section for the workshop, the young participants were allowed to go and look around the museum and focus on objects that inspired them, excited them, 
and incorporate them into their comics. So they went around the museum and they basically selected artifacts or objects, made notes about them and little drawings, and then they came back to the classroom and developed their comics. In another workshop context, we went to the Olympia building as it was renovated. It was a library, and within that library was a BFI. It was an archive of film and television. But what happened here was the participants, they engaged with their local history. They looked at the history of the building and of Bridgeton itself, and they made comics based on that research. So again, um, the pupils uh, made research based on uh, basically the material that they had uh, within the building, and it's um, a great thing that um, I guess you could do that in your own uh, local area and with your own local history on different aspects of um, of your own um, city or um, country. Once again, it's a good example of comics as stealth education because the fun of the comics attract people to the materials around. Recently, we were in a school in Glasgow. We did a dozen sessions in Oak Grove Primary on the theme, Home is Here, which encouraged the young people to make comics about migration. So we worked with a class of pupils who'd um, come from lots of different countries and had recently um, moved to Glasgow, um, or some of them were born in Glasgow, but their families had moved. And um, so um, they basically had to tell their own story um, or talk to their families and um, basically make notes about what had happened um, to their families. Um, so first of all, uh, we encouraged them to um, write a summary of their story. Earlier, we talked about uh, an exercise which was writing um, a very short paragraph. Well, here we're expanding on that and uh, the pupils can get to uh, write a long form story, basically like a prose, and then they can transform that into a visual story afterwards. We found this a very rewarding project. Every Thursday, we felt enormously cheered up Reading the summaries or synopsis of the stories, they were very beautifully written, full of lovely and interesting and exotic ideas. Some of the pupils really went ahead with their projects. Others were a bit slower. It was really interesting to see that some produced lots and lots of pages. Others made fantasy stories. They, they filtered their story and distilled it down into something completely different and worked in black and white. Working on a residency like that allows a greater degree of interaction and a more in-depth project. There are also quicker and more fun projects like this 45-minute comic challenge. So this was a workshop uh, with a class and they had to uh, divide themselves into small groups and they had 45 minutes to come up with a complete comic. So it was complete mayhem and they all ended up working all at once on the same pieces of paper. Um, but it's a great way to get children to basically collaborate together and develop a project together. We saw lots of ways that they began to communicate with each other and racing against the clock made it good fun. It was quite difficult and chaotic, as Sandra said. Another project we were involved in in Strinrar, way over in the west coast of Scotland, was again a residency where we engaged over a whole week. This time we saw the children making one of our favourite things, which is mini comics. So, um, kids love to um, create their own mini comics so they can um, hear they basically created their pages and then they stapled the covers. Some of them had uh, great fun and were very inventive with the uh, uh, kind of collages to make their covers. And some of them even came up with back covers with price points and even barcodes and everything. Recently, we were at a local school. It's only half an hour's walk from this Hollywood high school. And we worked with EAL pupils again. This time we, we saw them working in groups. There were, there were children from Romania, children from Slovakia, and they all worked together or on their own or in pairs. And what we were able to do here is the reduced cost of printing nowadays is make a comic anthology collection that we could show at a so showcase evening to their friends and family. So it's a very re rewarding thing for um, pupils to basically see their work collated into an actual real book, and they usually get really excited about that. As well as doing workshops and residencies, we were also patrons of reading at Northfield Academy. We did that over a period of over four years, and that allowed a deeper relationship to be built with the school, with the librarian, Mandy Wilson in particular, and also with the teachers and the head teacher. Now, Northfield is quite a deprived, a socially deprived area of a relatively wealthy city, Aberdeen. And we saw over the four years change as the school improved, its academic results improved. And we recognized that the pupils had more self-esteem. 
a lot of positives came out of this situation we were in. And one of our favorite projects was the Scottish Scientists Project. The children were asked to research famous Scottish scientists and inventors, and then think about which one they were most interested in. And working with a relatively dry subject, they turned it into comics. So in the first instance, they did research on, on the internet, but also uh, in the library itself, with the help of the librarian, um, collated all their information and then uh, transformed it into comics. And um, some of these pupils uh, were maybe um, not as good academically, but it gave them an opportunity to um, basically access the subject of science, which is for them a little bit dry sometimes, um, and make it turn it into something fun. I think what we recognised through all these workshops and the residencies and the patrons of reading period is that comics are great not just for reluctant readers and beginning readers, but they're also great just for readers in general. As we said, they're a form of comparative literature, similar to film, and the comics are, of course, silent. We also saw, and we passionately believe, that comics are a powerful art form in their own right. Whenever we do talks and workshops, one of the things we try to share is our creative process. And this we really see as stealth education because what we talk about is the planning the project, the editing of a project and how these things can be incorporated, not just for the obvious things like arts and literature, but right across the curriculum. So we talk to the young people about where ideas come from and how ideas don't always come fully formed. For example, our character Louis began as a nearly model and developed over time to become more like a little person. And um, children sometimes feel that they, they can't draw or that they're, what they're going to draw is maybe not going to be good enough, uh, especially the first time they draw it. So we like to emphasize that uh, basically no one is like brilliant at drawing and, and it's totally normal to like make mistakes. And it's quite important, in fact, to redo like drawings that you're not happy with because that uh, gives an opportunity for improvement. We also showed them the beginnings of Harrison Grace, how it started as Hansel and Gretel, and we introduced a new character, Uncle Claude, because the children can't be alone in the woods on their own, and also how we introduced a conservation scientist and how these characters developed from simple sketches to more finished characters. We also talked about having ideas from our passions. Sondra and I are both very much inspired by music and by nature, for example, here a caterpillar became a character in our book Louis Knight's Abbott. It could represent fear, a nameless trend. I can't draw the way Sandra draws, but again, we emphasize the importance of just playing and how doodling or just cartooning or just daydreaming can bring about ideas. Explaining what goes into the writing is always quite difficult, but we talk about how we're trying to inspire each other and support each other in developing a story. The story itself, we write in script form. The script is broken down into panel chunks. And I'll also give Sandra a diagram of how the characters develop and how the story itself progresses. We also like to write a synopsis, um, which is the, the summary of the story. It gives us a, a, a good idea of uh, basically where we're going with the story, but also gives our editors a good idea of where the story is going. And also it gives them a chance to um, give us feedback so that we can edit. Once everyone's happy with the synopsis, it's a great basis for a script. And here I'm writing a more rigorous script because it's not just for Sandra and I. This is a script that's going to be read by editors. And once everybody's happy with that, then Sandra can go to the drawing board. Well, first of all, I'll do uh, pages of layout or dummy, which are basically sketches of what the finished book is eventually going to be. But that's a really important step in the making of the comic because it's where the scripts and words become uh, basically a story, uh, a visual story. So we have to decide how many images go on each page, how they're going to be composed, how they're go going to be paced, which is like the rhythm of the reading, which is very important, how much text we're going to be uh, placing on each page. Uh, these are pages of layout from um, Harris and Grace, and here we had a final word count of about 4,000 words for the whole book. So each page had to have a certain amount of words um, to uh, for, the, for the book to work, basically. So it was an extra parameter that we had to think about. But in a way, it helped us guide the story. What we did was we top loaded each chapter. And it also, when you think about young people reading these books, they're excited about the comics. And it's quite quick to read speech bubbles. But there's sometimes a bit more reading at the beginning and end of the chapter. And it sort of leads them into reading in a good way. 
So at this point, the layout goes to uh, our editors who give us feedback again, and then there's editing going on. And then once everyone's happy with it, I go to the drawing board, which is nowadays a screen. Now this page that I'm drawing here is actually from the Little Mermaid's graphic novel. Um, so first of all, I place all the different elements on the page uh, very roughly, just uh, very simple elements. And then I go into much more detailed penciling on top of it. So this is the part where I basically have to make sure that everything's drawn correctly. If I make a mistake and I make lots of mistakes, I can just click a button on my pen, which erases my latest line. Then it's the inking stage. So all these different steps are done on different layers so that I can uh, just get rid of my preceding layers when I've uh, finished with them. And then finally, it's the coloring stage. And I build basically the pages with layers of colors and texture uh, for the Little Mermaid here. That's not the only way of making a comic, obviously, and for our um, Paris and Grace and Freya books, we worked uh, slightly differently for uh, the coloring stage. It was much more simple coloring. I also got involved placing the text in the correct pages and doing what's called the color flats, trying to speed up the process because we were under quite a bedroom. So that's us reached the end um, of our talk. Thank you very much for listening to us this morning. If you would like to find us on our website, metro.com or on social media, we are uh, on all these different platforms.